What do all these companies have in common? They have a huge market share. I'm sure all of us have used Amazon to order things like a book online. Um, all of us have Googled something on the internet, have searched for something using the Google search engine. Um, almost everyone has a Facebook account. Um, if you're in China, maybe you don't because of censorship, but there's Baidu and WeChat, and this is used by everyone. And many of us are tied into what these companies call ecosystem. Uh, ecosystem. So um, be it Microsoft or Google and Android or, or Apple. It basically means you have your MacBook, you have an iPhone that works well with it. You have to use the App Store to download your software on the iPhone and you're using Apple Cloud Storage. Uh, but basically you are tied into, into an ecosystem that combines different devices and different services. Another example is I like watching Arsenal play on TV. And to do that, I need a Sky subscription because there is no alternative. It's not on TV anywhere else. I cannot buy an alternative provider of Arsenal matches. Okay. And these are all examples of firms with enormous market power and in some cases monopolies. And that's the topic of today's lecture. What is a monopoly? Monopoly means one seller from monos polain, ancient Greek. Huh? Uh, and a monopoly is basically if one firm uh, is the only seller of a product and there are no close substitutes to the product. And that's quite different from the example we saw in the first week from the espresso market, right? Where there were many sellers. And, you know, granted, some espresso producers or, 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 or coffee places are better than others. So I would rather go to Store Street, for example, or to Fleet uh, a cafe than, than to Starbucks or Costa, but in the end, these are all pretty close substitutes. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that everyone, the buyers of espresso and the sellers of espresso are price takers. They have to accept the sort of market price for espresso and can't charge twice as much, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or else they wouldn't have any buyers, any consumers. But that's radically different for the question of you know me watching Arsenal on football, uh, Arsenal on TV. Um, there is nowhere else to go. I have to buy the Sky subscription. I cannot legally watch Arsenal play on TV anywhere else. Um, and there are also no close substitutes. You know, watching cricket instead is not going to do it. It's not a close substitute for me watching my favorite team. And even watching a Tottenham football match is not a close substitute for watching Arsenal on TV. That means that Sky, in this case, who's the only one broadcasting the, the football match, is a price maker. So they can decide how much they charge me for the subscription. And I have nowhere else to go. And this is a far cry from the sort of nice competitive market with many buyers and many, many sellers where everyone was a price taker that we encountered in the first week. It's capitalism, but without competitive markets. And that is a form of market failure, as we will see. But a form of market failure that has become so prevalent, so common, that it doesn't strike us as unusual or unnatural anymore. But as we will see, it is extremely bad for us as consumers and maybe for society as a whole. So as you will see soon, monopolies are bad for consumers. But if you follow the news, you will know that those activities are also potentially illegal. The US Department of Justice launched an investigation, formal investigation into Google. Um, the idea is that basically Google tries to restrict the sort of search engine market. They're trying to make sure that there are no competitors in the search engine market, that everybody keeps using Google. Why? Because it generates huge advertising revenue for them. So they basically force producers of mobile phones um, to make sure that, uh, that, that Google is sort of the default search engine. And it has also emerged that they pay huge sums of money, between eight and 12 billion pounds a year, or dollars a year to Apple. And this kind of sort of collusion engagement between these two internet behemoths will surely attract more, um, more attention by prosecutors.
So many monopolists not only exploit their customers by sort of overcharging, but they also engage in all sorts of anti-competitive behaviors. Um, and all of this is illegal, okay? Um, and governments uh, have competition authorities like the Department of Justice in the US or the FTC, um, the European Union's Directorate General for Competition, um, the German Bundeskartellamt, and here in the UK, the Competition and Markets Authority to try to fight these economic crimes. So today we have to learn why monopolies and oligopolies, where few firms control the market, are so bad, what the kind of behaviors are that these kinds of companies engage in, and what the competition authorities can do about it. But first, we have to understand how they arise. Where do those monopolies come from? So where do these monopolies come from? The fundamental source of monopoly are barriers to entry. So something that stops other companies joining in the market and producing the same good. And the most sort of traditional simplest example of um, barriers to entry of sources of market power is the exclusive ownership of a key resource. And sort of in the Middle Ages, early modern period, this, this was quite common, but it has today in practice become much rarer. But there are some, some nice examples of this. For example, De Beers, the diamond uh, sort of uh, company, controls most of the diamonds in the uh, diamond mines in the world and therefore controls the price of diamonds. Um, another example that is not a monopoly, but a cartel, uh, so an oligopoly with, with collusion, and they are very open about it, um, is OPEC. So the countries and sort of state owned usually companies that control oil production um, form a cartel and they try to control the, uh, control the output and production of oil in the world. Another example, the second sort of source of uh, barriers to entry are government created monopolies. Um, basically governments restrict the entry by giving a single firm the exclusive right to sell a particular good or service in a specific market. market. And these are things like patents and copyrights. And these are created with good intentions, of course. So, for example, if you were to, you know, as a drug company to create a new, you know, cure for the coronavirus, for the COVID uh, uh, disease, the government would want you to invest in this innovation, of course, and you should be able to reap the benefits of this innovation, get an innovation rent if you want, huh, by having the exclusive right to sell it. If every drug company could immediately copy the copy the um, the sort of new drug, then there wouldn't be an incentive to innovate. That's the argument. Or well, think about copyright. Um, last week or two weeks ago, I used a clip from the Golden Balls. Um, game show. Um, the copyright by, of which is held by Endemol. So I wouldn't be able to just broadcast all Golden Balls episodes yeah, uh, because they are the ones who produced it and they are the only ones who are allowed to sell it. Thankfully for this class there is a sort of fair use exemption where they allowed me to use it because I've altered it sufficiently and because it's for educational purposes. But basically copyright and patent laws are classic sources of market power and monopolies. The third um, source of market power is what is called network externalities. Um, basically the idea that the fact that other consumers also use the product makes the specific product more attractive. And we all understand this from things like Facebook or WhatsApp. You know, we're not all on Facebook because it is the best possible way to display this sort of personal stuff about yourself. And we not all use WhatsApp because it is the single best way to communicate. We use those tools because all our friends use them as well. So basically, by because everyone else is using it, you want to use it as well. And this is what we call network externalities. And this has become a much bigger source of monopoly power and market power, um, of course, due to the internet. The fourth source of uh, market power are what is sometimes called natural monopolies. Basically, a natural monopoly is a, a situation where a single firm 
uh, or very few firms can supply a good or service to the entire market and at a smaller cost than two or more or many firms. Mm -hmm. In other words, there are economies of scale, uh, as you know from the first lecture, but over the relevant range of output. Mm -hmm. So it is best to organize with, with just one firm. The classic example are utilities like water providers. It is best to have only one water company. We wouldn't have, want to have sort of multiple pipes going in our home or changing the pipes and the and the the water filtration system and the you know water supply system every time we want to change sort of water uh, contracts uh, with a, with a different firm. So many utilities fall under this, and water is sort of the most extreme example. Um, a similar argument often gets made for electricity, although it is a bit, bit more complicated because we can, of course, as long as we control the network, be able to use different electricity providers because electricity is all the same, huh? um, no matter no matter how it how it arrives, basically. Um, another sort of uh, market in which this argument gets made, of course, in many cases, are railways. Um, we have see we see different. Uh, ways to organize railways in different countries, but there seems to be sort of an argument that it is in many cases uh, efficient to have basically just one large railway company for the entire country. And these economies of scale are another sort of source of market power that have grown in importance due to the internet and combined with 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 our own behavior, uh, with with our laziness, with the with the convenience of 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 just using the simplest nearest sort of provider huh? we are creating creating the incentives for for these monopolies so you know one of the reasons amazon is uh, has become so large is because for them sort of the marginal cost of supplying to one more consumer, you know supplying another book uh, is is really really small and for us it's really easy to just go to amazon basically so monopoly resources government created monopolies like patents and copyrights network externalities like the case of facebook and whatsapp and natural monopolies due to economies of scale are sort of the core um, causes of market power i hope you're not asleep okay uh, let's do a quick exercise to check our understanding so look out of the window for a second uh, and then take a piece of paper or open a new document and what i want you to do is come up with an example for each of our four types of barriers to entry monopoly resources government created monopolies like patents and copyrights network externalities and natural monopolies so economies of scale so pause the video and see if you can come up with a new interesting original example for each of those four categories go did you come up with some good examples great so there is a big debate raging, of course, and this centers around the following question. Those internet giants, they provide great benefits to customers, to consumers. The iPhone, Gmail, these are great products. So maybe those companies that dominate today's economies are basically just reaping sort of temporary rents from innovation because they're making great products. And soon they will have competitors snapping at the heel. Before Facebook, there was MySpace and we see apps like TikTok, etc. emerging. So maybe these, you know, monopolies or this dominance is only temporary. And it is basically this kind of temporary monopoly that has spurred the innovation that led to these great products in the first place. The counter argument to this, of course, is that the internet itself basically has led to the growth of monopolies in, in every sector. And as Stiglitz calls it, we live in the age of monopoly. Of course, only time will tell whether these are temporary monopolies or whether they are permanent. But Microsoft, who was the big player in the 90s and maybe early 2000s, is still around and it is still pretty big and pretty influential. I think the case that the internet basically has effects that make it more likely, make the emergence of sort of monopolies more likely is incontrovertible. Um, the internet basically causes 
natural monopolies and causes monopolies due to network externalities. The marginal cost of Amazon supplying to one more customer uh, out of its sort of huge uh, stock of books uh, with tons, thousands of warehouses um, is, is really, really small. Mm. And compare this market uh, where there's one dominant supply of books uh, to a situation like it was before the arrival of the internet where there were thousands of bookstores. Mm. Um, it's quite obvious that they are due to the internet sort of huge uh, gains in gains in uh, in cost. So we now have a world where we have one big, big, big book bookseller, Amazon, plus sort of cafes masquerading as as bookstores. Uh, the other sort of um, effect that the internet clearly has is the creation of stronger sort of network externalities. There's a reason there's only one Facebook. Mm. There's only one LinkedIn for business contacts. Uh, those network externalities loom large. Uh, there's no value in me creating my own Facebook and posting pictures for no one else to see. And these are partly sort of real switching costs. Mm. Um, and partly it's just our laziness to look elsewhere. Sometimes you get the objection that Amazon is really cheap. And you're right, they don't charge you more than, than, than the bookshop around the corner, at least so far. Um, but of course, that misunderstands sort of the nature of two-sided markets and the platform economy. The squeeze here is not necessarily on the customer. Mm. Uh, it could be on the supplier, right? So Amazon is basically unavoidable for publishers. Uh, a book not listed on Amazon doesn't exist. Mm. And as a consequence, um, Amazon is acting almost like a monopsonist, like a, like, a, like a buyer with market power vis-a-vis -vis publishers. Or take Apple. Apple takes a 30% cut from all app revenue. And there's no choice for app producers. So some of you have maybe heard of this case between the makers of the Fortnite game and, and, uh, and Apple. And this is exactly centered around this, uh, this kind of problem. So yes, we as a consumers of the apps are perhaps not uh, not being squeezed, but the producers are being squeezed by the platform uh, company. Another common objection is that, but, but, but Google search and YouTube videos are free, right? Well, that's correct. But you're not just a consumer here. You are the product. Uh, Google search results are the most important advertising real estate ever. The product that is being sold is your attention, uh, your eyeballs. Uh, that's what the company is after, is being sold to advertisers. You know, plus your personal data, of course, to target advertising even better. Um, and this is true for Google and for Facebook and for many of these um, providers. So the behavior of these tech companies actually speaks louder than their sort of feel-good image as innovators. They engage in anti-competitive behaviors. The tying of products, bundling, squeezing suppliers, you know, the abuse of the app store, um, mergers to remove potential competition, um, and basically a skyrocketing share price based on incredible profits, which are often not taxed at all because they shift you know, their tax burden to low tax jurisdictions. All of these are pretty good indications that these are indeed companies that abuse their market power. We should now have a pretty good understanding of the causes of monopolies and market power. And we have encountered some of sort of the dominant companies uh, in today's economy. So for the rest of the lecture, in the next video, we will work through sort of the fundamental idea of how monopoly works. How is the monopolist able to extract all this extra revenue from us? And why is monopoly so bad? In a funny video after that, we will watch John Oliver sort of dissect the problem of mergers and the loss of competition in many sectors. And he has some really great fun examples. In the fourth video, we will encounter the problem of oligopoly, of few sellers, and specifically the problem of cartels. And we will encounter the German Autokartell in this respect. And the final video, of course, provides solutions. Um, so it looks at competition policy. 
and what the Department of Justice and the FTC and the DG competition of the European Union and this competition in markets authority, what these government regulators can do about these problems.